Hi, I'm Jesse Davis. If you're a member of the open source community, I want you to contribute not just your code, but also your words. I want you to write an excellent programming blog. So if you're watching this video, I assume that you're already committed to writing and you've probably published some articles already. But nevertheless, I want to share with you some of my reasons why I think writing is good for you and me and benefits us all. The first reason is that you're a specialist. It's in the nature of being a programmer that we don't ever write exactly the same code twice. We're always doing something unique, and that's why we're all specialists. So whether you're famous or consider yourself an advanced programmer or not, you are the preeminent expert in your specialty, and I want you to write about that specialty. So you might be an expert at parsing New York City subway schedules in Python or in doing Python development without an internet connection or accommodating colleagues with disabilities. Whatever it is that you know how to do well, I want you to write it down so that I can learn from you. Additionally, sharing your expertise sends up a flair to advertise to your fellow specialists what you're into so that they can find you. I've found that writing about whatever it is I'm working on or what I'm interested in helps me connect with people who share those interests and it allows us to share ideas and help each other out with problems and in that way contribute to each other's projects in ways that are actually much deeper and more productive than submitting patches and pull requests to each other. But even if nobody ever reads what you write, writing is still worthwhile because writing is thinking with superpowers. I use this superpowered thinking whenever I meet a problem or a bug that I'm afraid is going to be over my head. Like, for example, a few years ago, I ran into this problem. I was using Python 2.6 because I have to. And it appeared to me that in Python 2.6, assigning to a thread local is not thread safe. And this blew my mind and was so frighteningly complex that I knew I wouldn't be smart enough to diagnose this bug unless I was able to supercharge my thinking. So that's what I did. I started writing an article about how I diagnosed this bug. And here it is. Now, I know you're going to be tempted to try to read this text while listening to me, so I'm going to help you avoid that temptation. So I started writing this article about how I diagnosed this bug before I had actually diagnosed it, right? I started writing the story before the story was finished. And this allowed me at each stage of attacking the bug to write down my assumptions, figure out my hypotheses, determine whether I had tested them thoroughly and consolidate my understanding at each stage. By the end, I had diagnosed one of the most complex bugs I've ever had to. It was unreported. It was, in fact, a intermittent memory leak in Python 2.6 due to a concurrency bug. And at the end, I had determined a simple workaround to the bug, and I had also come up with uh, a pretty good article about a really awful problem that I had solved. So I'm sure that you're already convinced that writing benefits you and me and all of us. You're probably here because you want to know how to write more and better. So that's what I'm going to share with you. I've found that 
generally speaking, people procrastinate writing or they experience writer's block. And I don't know why writing is like this. You don't generally hear people talk about coder's block. If there's code you need to write, generally people just do it and they don't procrastinate the way they do more or less uniquely when they have something that they want to write in prose. But even though I don't really understand this phenomenon, I've found a way out of it through a series of basic concepts that I'm going to share with you. And overcoming writer's block has been this real joy for me. I've found that I'm a very productive and prolific writer, and I don't feel any kind of guilt or anxiety about things that I want to write but can't make the time for. So that's what I'm going to share with you today. So the agenda for this talk is why writing is so great for you and for all of us. And we've covered that. So the next steps are going to be what to write, who is going to read your writing, how to improve your writing, and when to make the time for writing. And by the time we're through with that, you'll have a basic approach to writing about programming that will overcome writer's block and make you an effective communicator. So what should you write? I find that when I read articles about programming I admire, they fall into roughly five categories. And the first of these are stories. Stories are the original form of human communication, and you know how to write a story. You just relate a series of incidents. You say, once upon a time, there was a foo. This happened, and then that happened. I learned an important lesson, and that's the story of foo. Notice that there is a moral to the story. You learned an important lesson because that's the value that you're promising to your reader if they read your story to the end. A good example of a story about programming is this famous article by Glyph called Unyielding. And it's deservedly famous. Glyph tells an appealing story about a concurrency bug and how it taught him that Explicit async code is not just more efficient under certain circumstances, but is also much less prone to race conditions. So once upon a time, Glyph was writing a text adventure game using multi-threaded Java. And because he was using multi-threading, he had a race condition. And the bug was that so players in his game could have a brass cockroach in their inventory. And from time to time, on a timer, the brass cockroach would leap out of their inventory and go scuttling around the game world. But due to the bug, the cockroach would sometimes both jump out of the player's hands, but also leave a copy of itself in the inventory. This caused the number of cockroaches in the game to exponentially multiply until they filled the entire game world and all players' inventories. And this caused the game to be completely unplayable and what was supposed to be just sort of a funny and whimsical feature of the game instead inspired existential terror. So it's funny, it's an appealing and memorable story about a specific incident, and it also is a compelling way to teach his basic lesson that explicit async code is easier to debug than multi-threading is. So this is the kind of story you might write about programming. Besides stories, opinions are the next kind of thing that you might write. And opinions, they're structured just like we learned in high school. You state a thesis, you back it up with points of evidence, you anticipate and head off likely objections to your opinion, and you conclude by restating your thesis. 
the important thing about opinions is it's not enough to just have an opinion. You should have an interesting and insightful thesis to argue for backed up by interesting points of evidence. So don't just go attacking other people's ideas or other people's code. Mr. Miyagi says karate is for defense only. A good example of a productive opinion piece is Julia Evans's article, Don't Feel Guilty About Not Contributing to Open Source. She has this interesting argument that you go through periods where open source software just works for you. You can use it and there aren't any bugs you need to fix or features you need to add in order for it to work. And when you're in a period like this, contributing to other people's projects just out of sense of guilt or obligation doesn't lead to the best contributions because it's not responding to a specific use case. So when you're in one of these periods, you shouldn't feel guilty about not contributing to open source. It's an interesting, non-consensus opinion, but it doesn't attack anybody, it doesn't hurt anybody's feelings, and it's, it includes insights about the circumstances under which the most useful contributions arise. So this is the kind of opinion that I propose you write about programming. The next kind of writing, probably the most common kind of article that we write about programming is how-tos. And the structure of a how-to is simple. You say that doing something is important under the given conditions. I'm going to show you how to do it. You do this step and then you do that step. There, now I've shown you how to do it. You should go out and do it. Notice that the very first part of a how-to is the motivation. You say that it's important under the given conditions. This tells your reader whether reading your article is going to be valuable to them or not, based on whether they need to know how to do this thing. A great example of a how-to is Kenneth Reitz's article, Growing Open Source Seeds. So Kenneth is the author of Requests and a number of other extremely popular Python projects, and he's writing about how to start a project that becomes popular and is well-maintained so that you don't disappoint your users and also you don't burn out by trying to fulfill their every desire. He begins with a motivation for you. He tells a story about a Facebook project that was open sourced and then left unmaintained and all their users were angry at them for not keeping up with users' requests. So he motivates you to read his article by telling an example of what can go wrong. So you don't want that to happen to you in your project. Another thing that we can learn by emulating Kenneth's article here is notice what he calls this. He calls it an essay. He doesn't say it's a blog post. And I encourage you to think of what you write as an essay or an article, because those words connote a deep and well thought out piece of writing with lasting value that stands the test of time. Whereas a blog post is ephemeral and casual and it's here today and gone tomorrow. Essays or articles are the kind of writing that you should be investing your time in because they'll continue to pay off over the long term. Now, besides how-tos, there are also articles about how things work. I think that we all have a bit of engineer in us and a bit of scientist. Um, for the engineers, we want to know how to do things because we want to make things. And so that's what motivates us to read how-tos. But for scientists, on the other hand, we're motivated to find out how things work out of sheer curiosity just for the sake of knowledge. And for the scientist in us, you can write an article about how something works. Uh, and a side note here, I know that this is a Viper and not a Python. It was the best I could do, forgive me. 
So a good example of an article about how something works is uh, Alison Kapter's article. So it's structured like, do you wonder how something works? I'm going to show you how it's implemented. It does this and it does that. There, now I've shown you how it works. So Alison's article, it's about syntax warnings and symbol tables in Python. And she describes how one day one of her students at the Recurse Center, which was called Hacker School at the time, encountered this funny syntax warning because they'd done an import star from a module within a Python function call, rather than the usual place, which is at the module level. So for the engineer, we don't need to understand why this happened because the workaround is clear. You just don't do that. You import at the module level instead of within functions. But the scientific part of Allison's personality wouldn't let her rest there. She was curious about where the syntax warning came from and satisfying her curiosity led her to explore uh, details about the Python compiler and Python scoping rules. And for the curiosity of all of us, she explained it so that we could understand better how it works. The final kind of article that I suggest you write is a review. Anytime you play a video game or finish a book, see a movie, or try out somebody's open source project, you could write a review of it. Now, reviews are a little bit dangerous, so here's the structure that I want you to consider. Say that you read or saw or played or used something, and then say, this is what it is. This is what your experience was like. The thing that you're reviewing has these strengths and weaknesses. And in conclusion, it's best when evaluated by certain criteria. So this is not mostly an evaluation. It's not thumbs up or thumbs down. You're not saying whether you like or dislike the thing. You're not giving it four out of five stars on Yelp. You are spending most of your time not evaluating, but describing and analyzing the thing that you're reviewing. I think that that is the most valuable way to write a review for the sake of your readers. So I'm going to show you a review that I wrote, and uh, I'm sorry for tooting my own horn again, and I promise that this is the last time. Uh, and once again, I'm going to blur out the text to save you from the temptation to read it now. Uh, I'll share a link at the end of this with links to all of the articles that I'm talking about, as well as other resources for improving your writing. So this is my review of an O'Reilly book, Building Node Applications with MongoDB and Backbone. And I tried to write this review in a way that would be very useful to readers of my review. So I described the book. It builds an example application with these technologies, chapter by chapter. And I say what my expertise was going in. I know MongoDB well, but not Node. And I describe my experience as somebody with that level of expertise reading this book. I do say that the book has some weaknesses. I didn't like the author's exception handling pattern. I thought that he was showing a dangerous method. Um, but also the book had a lot of strengths. Its application was thoroughly described and well thought out and presented uh, in a very methodical way. And in conclusion, I thought that if you have a certain level of expertise, reading this book is a great way to bring that to the next level. So I wrote this review trying to make it useful to, for readers of my blog who are trying to evaluate whether they should invest the time in reading this book or not. I think that this is the kind of review that you should consider writing. So I promised that you would be able to overcome writer's block and stop worrying about making time for writing. 
And these five what's can help you with that. So let's say that you want to write something, but you don't know what topic to choose. Looking at these five kinds of articles can help you with that. So ask yourself, is there something you know how to do that you want to write an explanation of? Or is there an opinion you, that you want to argue for um, or something that you understand and you want to explain how it works? You can use these five things to generate ideas about topics to write about. On the other hand, if you have a topic that you do want to write about, but you just can't get started, you can use these five what's to decide how to write the article. So maybe your topic is best explained in a story or in a how-to, or maybe you want to explain how something works. That can be your approach to writing an article about your topic, and you can use the templates that I've shown you and just fill in the blanks. Once you've filled in those slots, then you already have an outline of your article and you're already halfway to writing it. So that's what I do to overcome writer's block. So that's what to write. Now, who is going to read it? How do you find your audience? And right off the bat, let me tell you that this is not about search engine optimization. SEO is a set of techniques for competing with similar writers for a mass audience. And that's totally the opposite of what you're doing. You're writing articles about your specialty for your fellow specialists. Now, what you want to do in order to get the word out to your fellow specialists is to get your feed aggregated by the aggregators that those specialists read. Now, if you're writing about Python, we all read Planet Python, and it's an aggregator that pulls from feeds of Python programmers writing about Python. And if you go to the link that I'll share at the end of this talk, I'll show you instructions for getting aggregated by Planet Python. If you're writing about something else about data science or NoSQL or visualization, find the aggregators for those specialties and get your feed included in them. There are also all of these weekly emails like Python Weekly or PyCoders Weekly. Whenever you publish a relevant article, you can email the editors of these weekly emails and ask to be included in them. Pretty much if you do that basic legwork, specialists in your field will find you. This is what Google was built for. You're writing with the keywords that these specialists are searching for. If you just put the time into writing useful articles, they'll read them. So how do you improve your writing? How do you write something worth reading? Practice, read, and get an editor. Writing like any skill improves with practice. And in particular, the way to improve your writing is to uh, find the articles and the writers whom you admire most. And when you write, emulate them. Figure out what it is about their style and their communication techniques that makes their articles effective and emulate them. Additionally, make a commitment as somebody who cares about writing to be somebody who reads articles to the end. This will distinguish you from 90% of the readers on the internet. When you read an article on a topic you care about, read it to the end. And don't just skim it, but really read every word. And when you reach the end, just take a moment to ask yourself, did you find the article effective or ineffective? And either way, how could the article be improved? Just doing this much will make your reading so much more valuable to refining your writing and make you a powerful communicator. And finally, get editors. Share your drafts with your writer friends. 
you'll pretty quickly find out that some of your friends just say, hey, great job. And some of your friends give really useful criticism. Lean on those friends and become writing buddies who swap drafts and critique each other's work. How do you make time to write? When will you write? This seems to be the complaint of just about every coder who is committed to sharing their words. They have ideas that they want to write down, but they just can't find the time. So first of all, don't feel guilty about not writing frequently. We're not writing BuzzFeed here. We don't make any money off of our writing and we're not obliged to create a constant stream of contact, content. So write infrequently. Write when you're inspired. Write when you have an idea or you make a discovery or you accomplish something that you just can't wait to share with your fellow specialists, with your community. So write infrequently and write when inspired. That's when you'll create words of lasting value to your readers. But if you write infrequently, how do you practice writing and how do you keep that muscle toned? I suggest that you write short things and reviews are particularly good for this because there's always a stream of new topics to write about because you're always reading books or seeing movies or whatever it is. It doesn't have to be about programming. Just Whenever you have the chance, whenever you finish a book, for example, commit to spending just an hour writing down in a few paragraphs what the book was, what it was like to read it, and its strengths and weaknesses. I think that condensing your experience down to a few paragraphs is a wonderful writing exercise. And by doing this, from time to time, you can really improve your writing muscles. So writing is great for us all. It improves your thinking. It connects you with your fellow specialists. It shares your expertise. And the next level of generosity is writing together. This year, my company, MongoDB, we've started a tech blog where the programmers among us can share our achievements and our discoveries and uh, talk about what we're doing with our wider community. And I've had the best time editing my friend's work and writing for the blog and soliciting articles, hearing about things that people are working on and encouraging them to write them up for our blog. Uh, it's really a wonderful thing to do. So if your company has a tech blog, I strongly encourage you to write articles for it. And if your company does not yet have a tech blog, this could be a great opportunity for you. As somebody who cares about writing, you can start a tech blog for your company and write for it and solicit articles for it. It can be a great way to get the word out about what you're doing and it can be a great way to advance your career using your writing skills. Additionally, if you're a member of a nonprofit or you're working on a project or you're a member of a community, blog for and about that project. I've been writing this year for the PSF blog as well, and it's been a great way to uh, connect with people I admire, interview prominent members of the Python community for the blog, stay abreast of PSF news and find out how PSF grants are benefiting people. You can do this for whatever projects or communities that you're involved with too, and it can be a great way to contribute to them. So I'll conclude with the promised link. It's bit.ly slash programming dash blog. This has links to all of the articles I talked about today ways to get included in aggregators to get the word out, and other links for ways to improve and refine your ability to communicate about programming with words and write an excellent programming blog. Thank you very much.